thanks for, thanks for hanging out, those of you who are still here. <clears throat> okay. So um, if you're interested in following along at all, this URL is my home page. The, the um, slides are there, as well as the GitHub link and a link to the live spot. So first of all, I want to warn you that this is really not a serious talk. Um, when you're being serious, you reason in a business-like way. You identify a need, and you find a solution for it. I'm going in the opposite direction. Um, finding some interesting technology and then trying to do something with it. Um, who cares if it's practical or even anything users want? After all, nobody wanted a spring that could walk downstairs. Nobody was in need of sticky goo that could pick up the Sunday comics. Also, I'm not going deeply into code. Um, I'm not going to show you the inner workings of anything, and I'm probably not going to make you a better JavaScript coder. The structure of the talk is this. I'm going to show some software building blocks and a couple of apps you can build with them. So the building blocks are these APIs. I'm going to show demos of each that are minimal in the sense that they're just big enough to do something and no bigger. Um, each of them shows just how one API works on its own. The idea was to keep them uh, clean and, and, and free of styling or any kind of inessential features so they're easy to pick up and put into a larger project or chain together as I've done here. So that's my redeeming social value. Um, I'm also presenting two toy apps <clears throat> that are cobbled together from these APIs. I call them toy apps for two reasons. One, because they really don't do anything all that useful. And two, because they're skill-based toys in that you have to learn an otherwise useless skill to enjoy them. Uh, there are apps that change the world, and there, then there are other apps that have to wait for the world to change around them. Uh, these are the second kind. You might say they're ahead of their time. So last year, about this time, I got excited about speech as a way to interact with a computer. There's something magical about it. You don't have to touch anything, move anything, do any work on objects that are external to your body. Just saying something causes my computer to react. It's literally action at a distance. So speech has a lot of great qualities. It's easy. It's high bandwidth. We'd usually rather be talking than typing. If you talk for a living, you're lucky. Um, it's one of the first things you learn. It's pretty much the last thing to go. Um, if you're interested in making interfaces that are easy to use, well, one aspect of ease of use is ergonomics. Reduce the physical effort needed to get something done. One click is a nice goal. Speech offers the possibility of zero clicks, which makes it, by traditional standards, a truly effortless interface. No clicking or typing, just say the magic words. Now, when you start thinking about using voice input, the first thought is of voice commands. This is hard to do well. It can be incredibly frustrating for users. Because of the errors in speech recognition, you end up limiting your vocabulary as you design your system, which means that users need to know the available commands or, or guess the available commands. Um, the big problem is really the same as for general transcription of speech. How can you recover from errors? Because speech recognition errors are going to be unavoidable for a long time. And human speech production um, will never be unavoidable because we're people and we make mistakes as we talk. Um, so look at the difference in error correction between a command line interface and voice. With a command line, it's kind of easy. You up arrow, arrow left, type over your arrow, submit. With voice, you have to there's no go back, so you have to repeat your entire command over and over again, try to enunciate better, maybe speak a little bit higher, try different wording, and all that can be very frustrating. So here's Fred Armisen being a glass hole on Saturday Night Live, trying to get it to connect uh, to the CBS Wi-Fi. The password is peacock, peacock, peacock. It's really frustrating. So. My point here is that the keyboard is really a great interface for precise input. Um, voice input causes more trouble than it's worth when you need real precision. Typing is digital in the original sense. You do it with your digits. And each keystroke either succeeds or it doesn't. Speech is analog and contains deep information. Um, so the standard methods of using speech are for voice commands or transcription, but there's a third direction that might lead somewhere sometime, and that's the idea of overheard conversation. That's what I'm going to use as input. 
Um, with the new always-on voice recognition chips, your cell phone and computer will be able to pick up on any speech going on around them. There's this thing called life logging. Um, and that brings us to my question, can a computer make itself useful by listening to my conversations? Okay, that's enough for the preamble. Let's start the demos. I hope they work on this new computer I'm using. Um, the first one is the simplest way to do use speech in your application. And I'll put on my little headset so that this will work. Hello. Hello. It worked. I'm so happy. And that's not working. OK. So that's with the addition of this one little attribute to the input tag. Um, the, it's nice that it's so simple. Um, but it's really hard to make much use of it. It stops recording the moment you pause more than about half a second. It gives, you up, gives up if you speak too long. It only accepts short phrases. Uh, there's no feedback when you talk, so you don't know if you're speaking clearly enough. Uh, since it only works on short bursts of speech, you have to keep your hands on your mouse and keyboard, which means it really can't be used to make a hands-free interface. So then last year, about this time, Chrome came out with the Web Speech API, um, at least support for the speech recognition part of it, which is what I like. So let's, tr let's do a little demo of that. OK, so this time, if this works, you're able to see there. Let's come on. Come on. You can do better than that. You can see the hypotheses, the, the, the attempts it makes to understand what I'm saying. And it's being very slow right now. Come on. Come on. You can do better than this. Uh, keep going. Try. Try. Oh, it's really not happy. <laughs> come on. Come on. You can do. Now, there's, there's a couple of words you must know that I'm saying by now. Oof. This is, I don't know if it's the internet connection or if it's something about this machine, but we're really getting bad results. It's definitely a horse's, it's a horse's sheath, I'd say. I would definitely say this is a horse's sheath. Can you get that if I actually say what you think I said? No, you can't, Ashley. This is a horse's sheath, definitely. Can't even do that. Wow. So, um, well, I don't know about the rest of this today. With that doing that, oh well. But I'll continue on valiantly anyway. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, I just wanted to show a little bit of code. Now, you saw things going from gray to black there. It's because um, we get this on result um, callback many times a second from the Web Speech API. One of the parts of it contains the word speech recognition has made a decision about. It's called the final transcript here. Um, we get informed about new words that have made it to the final transcript only once. So we accumulate them in a buffer that gets dumped into that div, the black one or the black span. And the other is the system's guess about what we just said. And that gets refreshed on each on result event and displayed in the gray area. The result is that words bounce around in the gray area until things settle down. Then they move into the black. All right. <laughs> so here's the central observation I'm making. Um, if we can get somehow conversational input from users, then we can apply standard information extraction tools to it, even though these tools were developed to handle text, written text. Here are a few. Um, I'm going to use two of these, or try to today, named entity recognition and machine translation. Uh, I think you'll also see sentence segmentation if you look closely. So let's look at NER first. Uh, named entity recognition, there's a company called Alchemy that provides a free API. Here's my little example. Barbara Mushabush is a, identified as a person, as is her husband Bob. Everett and Olympia are cities, and Washington's a state. Um, so that's, that's free at a certain level. Certainly for a toy like this, it's perfect. Um, so here was what we've got. We have 
already. Text from continuous speech recognition and a list of names that were mentioned. What can we do with that? Well, it's clearly information that the intelligence community has a serious interest in. Um, with metadata about phone calls, they can build a network of the people you talk to. With NER on the content of phone calls, they can build a network of the people and things you talk about. Um, now hold that thought while I go off on something completely different. Um, if you have your own fake news show, you have a bunch of people who are um, finding pictures of the people you're about to talk about and displaying them in a rectangle over your shoulder. Uh, that rectangle I heard is called an inset. So here's my pitch. Have you ever struggled to describe something or someone in words when a picture would explain everything, but it's really not worth interrupting your conversation to do an internet search. So what you really need is computer-aided conversation. The computer eavesdrops on your conversation listening for names. When it hears a name, it searches for images of that thing and displays the images on the screen. Um, so finding related images is the next thing I need to do if I'm going to make this work. That's easy. Um, Bing gives you some free stuff. Here's a quick search of Scarlett Johansson misspelled, no problem. Um, Flickr also has a nice free little API that you run with Ajax here. Okay. So now, and this is going to be really bad. This is really be so bad. But let's try anyway. Um, yeah, leave safe search on, thank you. Um, all right. Okay, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Are you listening? Come on. There you go. That's one word you got. Oh. So the idea here is that, um, oh, man. Uh, the, the idea that I, I had was that we're trying to decide on a movie to go see. Uh, so, okay. With this happening this slowly, it's really almost not worth it. Um, can it get Joaquin Phoenix? No. It's, it's, okay. <laughs> Great, okay. Uh, the idea was to say uh, we wanted to see the Joaquin Phoenix movie with Scarlett Johansson. And hey, yippee, you got Scarlett Johansson. Um, it's by the guy who did Being John Malkovich. Can you do that? Come on, old Malkovich. Um, there's also the movie by Martin Scorsese. Okay. Um, with Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio, Jonah Hill. Come on. Can you get past temperature? <laughs> um, Matthew McConaughey's in that. Oh, well, look, Malkovich, that's nice. Um, I was going to mention Robert Mitchum, but it's dead, half dead. Come on. All right. <sighs> Well, that was pathetic, but let me just try one more time, see if it, hello? Can you, can you do any, nope, all right. So take my word for it, that was the worst I've ever seen it. Um, great. Um, the idea is that could have been me talking to a friend, a friend who was hard of hearing. Um, I wasn't really using the computer, it was just there listening, acting, when it had something to offer to the conversation like an attentive and very deaf servant. Um, so this would have been a lot more impressive if it actually worked. But um, there is a, <laughs> Wittgenstein had something called the picture theory of meaning, where a statement is meaningful, that is either true or false, if it pictures the state of affairs in the world. Um, he's using the word picture in a metaphorical sense here, but I'm gonna be unsophisticated and take it literally. Let's say a statement is a kind of picture. If a statement pictures the world, what are the proper nouns in it do? Well, they picture the things they refer to. Going from a statement to a picture of the world would be hard, except in the simplest cases, but it's easy to go from a name to a picture of the thing it names. If that makes any sense to you, then you will believe me when I say this app is the first step in a grand project to turn speech into pictures on the fly. After I wrote that, I went on Monday to UCSD, a, a talk by um, Richard, um, a guy from, UC, from, from Stanford, on deep learning, where he talked about doing pretty much the same thing, using compositionality of text and compositionality of images. Okay. 
So in, in talk show, a name is meaningful if we can find a picture of, the thing, of that thing on the internet. Of course, with a little effort, we could add pictures of your family and friends so they pop up when you talk about your vacation or a graph of last year's sales figures for the office. Now, the theory that says this could be a value is that communication involves, among other things, calling up pictures in your mind of the things we're talking about. Having a real picture on screen can avoid the miscommunication that happens when we're thinking about different things. Um, in any case, I'll take it as a given that uh, the benefit is somewhat small, so the effort has got to be small. And right now, it involves getting everybody to hover around a laptop or spending half an hour trying to get a screen to work. Um, what I think is that we have a general problem with screens in our time, and we certainly demonstrated that here. Um, come on. Oh, no. <laughs> ah, great. OK. That was a picture of people. This is another machine. Of, this is not my computer right now. So this, this, that was a picture of a bunch of people sitting around a table looking at their cell phones. Um, and that's what we do all the time now. And if somebody finds something they want to show, to other people, you pass your cell phone around and everybody watches it sequentially. I just think that has to change sometime and this is going to look so 2014. This is the, um, the peace talks on Syria in Geneva where they scattered these screens around on the floor. I think that's interesting. It seems funny, but it's actually a reasonable solution to the problem of sharing a screen when people are in a conversational configuration looking at each other instead of staring at in the same direction. Um, Let's see if, oh great, another one that's missing there. So I had a picture of a video wall in a cafe. Here's a video wall in someone's house. All right, so, great. Um, now, so, so it, it, one of the things I like to do is extrapolate wildly into the future based on limited information about the present. I predict that screens will get bigger and that they'll take over more and more of our visual space during the day. In 50 years, will screens cover every vertical space? Screens will be everywhere, like wallpaper in the 40s. All interiors will become holodecks. If that actually happens, then my app will have found its niche. It's an exercise in ambient computing, where computers take whatever input they can find in their environment and try their best to come up with something we'll want. Uh, another Warning to the reader, my predictions don't always come true. When I saw that they started putting advertising on the floors of supermarkets, I thought it wouldn't be long before they covered the floor wall to wall. That didn't happen. First time I got a robocall, I thought, what's to prevent them from flooding the phone lines with these until it becomes a general denial of service attack? We avoided that one, too. So I may be wrong about screens covering every space. But I can imagine conferences in the future having more screens than this and available to you to pair with with your phone. So that's my first thing. Now we're going to try another thing that's going to be, well, difficult too, but I have a video of it, so we'll switch to the video. Um, the translating telephone. Uh, this is, um, uh, this is uh, an app that requires a couple of other things that, that we need, which is uh, some sort of uh, communication platform. And I want to use text-to-speech. And, uh, and I'm going to use machine translation for it. So the communication pa platform that I picked is Web Speech, Web, uh, web Real-Time Communication, WebRTC. Um, it's peer-to-peer -peer voice, video, and data communications through a browser without plugins. You don't actually have a phone number. You just navigate to the same URL as everyone else, and you are in contact. Um, the video isn't really essential for my purposes, but this platform lets me control the web page displays for each user during a call. Um, a purely audio call with translation is very hard to manage because of the problem of errors that I've been mentioning. So combining video conferencing and speech recognition is already an interesting thing, I think, uh, if the speech recognition output is visible to each user and is fairly accurate. Um, add translation, and you get something that's quite powerful, although also quite dangerous. Um, machine translation is particularly challenged by speech. Um, statistical machine translation models are trained on text that was translated by humans for their own human purposes. People working in machine translation were lucky to have all this existing data around. But that meant they worked with text that was especially good. Written text that was worth translating by a human usually passes a high bar of grammaticality 
Sentences and paragraphs are well formed. Speech, on the other hand, follows different rules of grammar, relaxed rules of grammar that are quite different. Um, but it's rarely translated except at the UN, which is a special kind of speech. So real world, world training data is, is scarce. Um, so for translation, I'm using Bing. You get two million characters a month for free. Here's this tiny little demo that just goes from English to French. And voila, it worked. I have to be happy about the things that do. Um, this little bit of code shows how you manage the tokens for Bing, and I don't think I'll bother to go into that now, but you get a 10-minute token that you can use without having to go back to the server. Um, for speech synthesis, well, so we now have WebRTC and translation. Um, that's two of the three things we need to do, the translating telephone. By the way, I'm kind of, it's, I'm calling it the translating telephone, but it's really going to be uh, video conferencing and not just audio, multiple speakers, not just two, and multiple languages, not just two, together with synchronized text display. So for text-to-speech, it's soon going to be possible to use the web speech API, but for right now, you can use the stuff in Google Translate. Uh, let's see if this works. Hello. Yay. Here's a French one. Je suis désolé, mais la maison est un vrai bordel. Um, let me let it explain one of its limitations. When there are more than 100 characters, you have to split the source text into chunks and speak. Each chunk and sequence, and yes, it can sound funny. It's as if one sentence ends mid-sentence, and then another one starts up. So you can also play tricks like read an English sentence, but identifying it as French. At what time is the meeting? <laughs> I kid the French. Okay. I kid the French with love. <laughs> so now we're ready for the translating telephone, if only the audio would work correctly. Um, you know, I don't even think I'll, it's gonna be so ridiculous to try to do anything right now with this that I think I'll go straight to the video demo. Well, do you, I'll, I'll do a live okay. one after this. So, hey, Ali, was this, application easy to use at first? 아니요. 처음에는 사용하기가 정말 어려웠어요. 제가 연습을 많이 해야 했어요. So, yeah, I know what you mean. It's it's a toy, kind of like a yo-yo, um, where you have to learn a certain skill. Until you learn how to use it, it's just a round thing on a string. 네, 네. 그런데 지금은 제가 방법을 찾은 것 같아요. 충분한 연습을 한다. Okay. All right. Well, so that's that is the talk. Let me go back and do the, this possibly useless demo. But let's see what happens. Can you hear me now? Is this working at all? should be listening. Come on. Try it. Go, go. Oof. One go. That's all you got. One go. Come on. Can you get another go? Two goes. Yay. Three goes. <laughs> oh, you're doing a great job today. YouTube. Yes, I know you like YouTube. I know YouTube's your favorite thing. Uh, go, go, go today, YouTube. Nope. I know you like Google, too. All right, so how about something else? Can we talk about, I don't know, the weather or something? Oh, almost. No, I'm not talking about Ohio or almost. Oh, well. Um, I'm gonna have to, I'll put up a, a video of something where it's working for real, but this is, this is I, something is not working between me and this computer that I've never seen before. To, what? I don't know how to do that, but that, I don't wonder if that could affect things. Let's see, what if I, do you, are you working better now? It could be just the audio volume. I have no idea what's going on. It, isn't, it, it says it's better, and I have no idea what's going on. Okay, you like that? All right, maybe. So, all right, so you let me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 
maybe, maybe things are going sort of okay. No, baby, not that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we didn't want to talk about that right now. Come on. Do something. Come on, let's talk about, I don't know, uh, sports or something. How about, hey, how about that Super Bowl? Le sexe est meilleur. Non, <rire> aucune idée de ce qui se passe ne peut gêner aucune idée de ce que. Vous aimez cela, donc très bien maintenant. Bon, bébé, baby, bébé au okay, caisse, port des maintenant. Et que diriez-vous du Super Bowl Pushing the microphone away helped a lot, maybe. Still, you're not, you're not listening very well. Okay. Anyway, thanks. Something happened. Thank you. There was, there was uh, ten demos. Maybe seven of them worked fairly well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. You missed me there. Well, thanks a lot, everybody.